Hello everyone, I'm Bom Sun Park, Historian of Science at KAIST. Thank you so much for inviting me to this wonderful conference or a journey through online connectivity. I'm especially excited because Johannes Kepler is one of my favorite figures during the scientific revolution. And the conference title is Kepler's Garden. In that sense, I'm already connected to the people in Linz and other conference participants around the world. Delighted to meet you all in this way. In today's talk, I will just oppose Kepler with James Lovelock, who shocked the world with his Gaia hypothesis about the Earth in the late 20th century. With these two scientists, I'm going to emphasize the connectivity between nature and culture, or simply nature culture for the matter, in the new geological time called Anthropocene. Let us pause a little bit uh, to think about what we know about a modern science. We are subscribed to a set of binaries dividing human and non-human, living and non-living, and so on. We tend to think that the scientists should work on the right side, even for human subjects. When did this notion start? Of course, during the 16th and 17th centuries, the time of scientific revolution. But some people, including a philosopher and STS scholar Bruno Latour, asked, have you ever been modern? Or is it really possible to separate nature and culture, science and politics and so on? So he said that uh, we have never been modern. I will take this notion to understand Kepler's time and our time of the Anthropocene. Perhaps I don't need to uh, talk too much about uh, Kepler. Very briefly, his father died when he was very young so Kepler was raised by his mother, Katharina, an innkeeper's daughter. She was known to be a healer using medicinal plants that she grew in her garden and some ingredients from animals, such as bats' wings, a dangerous business indeed, even at the time. In fact, later on, uh, she was indicted as a witch, uh, but Kepler came to successfully defend her. This is a, a drawing of uh, 19, uh, 1577 Great Comet, and Kepler was only six years old at that time, and he was taken by his mother uh, to see the spectacle. As you know, the comet was regarded as a destroyer of an orderly universe with the Earth at its center. So it's a disorderly agent. An intellectual battle, as well as a religious one, was being waged over this geocentric worldview and Copernicus' heliocentric one. The best known astronomer at the time was Tycho Brahe, a Danish nobleman who later became the imperial astronomer in the Holy Roman Empire. Kepler was hired as his assistant and then succeeded him in 1601 hence this monument in Prague. What's important is the fact that Tycho Brahe was the champion of connecting celestial events with terrestrial affairs. So when he built an observatory castle called Uraniborg on the island of Van, he placed it in the middle of the garden where all sorts of plants were growing. We can have a good sense of his pursuit of his uh, connectivity uh, between heavenly and earthly things by looking at the design of the castle. This looks like an ordinary castle, but it's an observatory. The second floor is devoted to observing and recording the daily movement of uh, heavenly bodies. And on the first floor, the people are gathered to analyze the data. It's interesting to note that there is a furnace in the basement. And what is it for? It's for the alchemical studies. Why alchemy? The drawing on the right side 
has more details on the activities going on on each floor. Alchemy at the time was pursued as a terrestrial, uh, terrestrial astronomy to complement a better uh, celestial uh, astronomy. This complementary uh, study of astronomical observation and alchemical operation was the key to deciphering the mystery of nature and human all together. Quite independently, Kepler went on to study the mystery of cosmos by finding the geometrical relations of five planets within the solar system. He still held on to the view that all the, all the motions of the heavenly body should be circular, the image of perfect and then recurring. This he changed when he began to use Tycho Brahe's most accurate data in the early 17th century. Then he published his masterpiece, New Astronomy, in 1609, where he proposed the elliptical motion, elliptical motion of the planets, uh, with the belief that the sun is emanating the mysterious force, uh, holding up the plants, uh, planets and uh, moving them. Some historians even argue that giving up the uniform circular motion was more difficult than shifting to the heliocentric view. So it's some, someone called it the uh, uh, Keplerian revolution. Galileo was a good example who held the Copernican worldview but believed in the circular motion of the, of the heavenly bodies. He became famous for, his, uh, for improving a toy spyglass into a telescope. He was able to raise his uh, salary three times at the University of Padua by demonstrating the power of telescope to the leaders of the Venetian Republic. Why Venetian Republic leaders, politicians are interesting? Because with the telescope, you can spot the enemies coming uh, from the horizon faster than anybody else. Unlike Kepler, Galileo was more interested in proving that the so-called heavenly bodies are neither perfect nor mysterious. They are nothing more than rocks or de-animated billiard boards in today's term, which just follow the laws of motion. This particular perception of de-animation, de-animated objects, became the foundation of modern science, which is called the mechanical worldview. Now, fast forwarding to the 20th century. This photo may be very familiar to all of you, and this is uh, the bombing of Hiroshima in 1945, and this is uh, the, the city scene after the bombing. And since that time, we are also familiar with uh, socioeconomic changes that took place in around the world. And uh, for example, GDP per capita in UK is rising very uh, fastly. The Korea is no exception, and although the uh, the Korea took off uh, since 1970s instead of 1950s. So it is an upward, upward uh, uh, graph. And also uh, take a look at uh, sort of uh, changes in the natural phenomena and the temperature rise. Temperature rise also took place around that time uh, in the middle of uh, 20th century. And it's, it's a very steep curve. This is also the famous killing curve the concentration of a CO2 curve, uh, which was done by Charles David Killing in Honolulu. What's interesting is uh, we can also see the CO2 concentration was, has been raise, raised, uh, raising uh, in the ocean as well, and the pH uh, of acidity of, uh, of, of the ocean is going down, which means uh, the acidification of the ocean is, is, is being progressed. So we are in the era of great acceleration and uh, socioeconomic uh, indicators show the upward swing in many aspects like uh, population and uh, GDP and even uh, the number of uh, McDonald's restaurants. Also, uh, so natural uh, indicators also show there's some upward trends, CO2 concentration, nitrogen oxide concentration, methane, and so on. So we are in the era of great accelerations. 
In 2000, uh, the Nobel Prize winner Paul Crutchen proposed to use uh, the new term Anthropocene, uh, meaning human epoch, uh, to indicate the changes caused by the human activities. And it was taken up uh, by scientists and uh, humanities scholars, social scientists, artists, literary people all around the world like a fire. And this is uh, uh, the, the Economist magazine uh, has a special edition on, on the Anthropocene. And then it says that humans have changed the way the world works. Now they have to change the way they think about it too. And this is the, the poster of Anthropocene documentary and uh, uh, made by uh, Edward Bortinsky, uh, the Canadian photographer and, and um, the filmmaker. And he go around uh, the world and then see the, the massive changes on the surface of, of the earth uh, made by the human beings. And, and, and this on the left, is the, the mountain, uh, the marble mountain in Italy. And then you can see how, how much it was taken by the human beings. And then also the plastics and the chickens. And so uh, when we are talking about uh, the Anthropocene as a geological time, we need an evidence. And then some people say, that, well, chicken bone can be a fossil for the future, or plastics, or radioactive materials after uh, Hiroshima. And in, and in the 1950s and six, early 60s, there are a number of uh, nuclear bomb tests. And, and so uh, it's evident that it's around the world. And it's the most uh, compelling evidence is radioactive materials. So uh, this is the photo that I showed at the, the beginning of the, the presentation. And uh, this this is called the uh, Earth Rise. Uh, it's taken in uh, 1968 uh, by Apollo uh, number eight. And um, the astronaut there, uh, William Anders, called, said, we came out all the way to explore the moon. And the most important thing is that we discovered the Earth. This is a particular time when the environmental movements were, were, were rising. And uh, there was a Vietnam War. There was a, you know, the uh, assassinations of uh, important people in the United States. And this is a very depressing time. And this picture uh, gave people a new opportunity to look, look back on, on the Earth. As many of you know, the Apollo program was the product of the Cold War, the, the time when the United States and the Soviet Union were fiercely competing for the supremacy in technology and ideology. During that time, uh, the, the NASA, the agency for the space program, uh, not only uh, had a, the Apollo program, but also uh, wanted to, to explore uh, further out. And for example, whether there, there is a life in Mars or, or Jupiter and so on. So they uh, grouped together uh, the people who were very ingenious in, in finding, uh, in creating a detectors uh, to, to see whether there is a life or not. And then one of them, uh, one of those who were invited to uh, the group was James Lovelock. And then and it's interesting that the NASA called calling him a maverick. He is a uh, PhD in medicine, but he is an uh, engineer, inventor, uh, problem solver, and he's doing everything. And then he was invited. And even he didn't have any academic positions. And so he was invited to the group in California and then to see uh, how we can find uh, the, the life, the, the evidence of life in Mars. And his answer was that, well, we don't really have to send a person there to, to check it. We just need to see uh, whether the atmosphere there is chemically equilibrium or not. And he was able to, to uh, reach the conclusion by comparing the conditions in, on the Earth and on, on the Mars. In other words, in, in the, on the Earth, we don't have a chemical equilibrium. It's always changing and in flux. 
Why? Because of the living entities, the life on earth. In other words, biosphere. Biosphere is a sphere where the biological entities, the life uh, things, are living, and the bio biological spheres are affecting atmosphere. And atmosphere is also affecting uh, the bio biosphere. In other words, they are connected. That's, that's James Lovelock's discovery, and then this became the basis for his famous Gaia hypothesis. Bruno Latour, the philosopher, found it very interest, interesting and important. And, and he uh, tried to give uh, uh, some philosophical meanings on the Gaia hypothesis. Latour summarized Lovelock's problem in this way. Lovelock wanted to understand how the Earth is different from the Mars, of course, and in what respect the Earth is active. What's the meaning of being active? And, and without endowing it with a soul, some kind of a mysterious middle age kind of a soul. And what is the immediate consequence of the Earth's activities? And how the Earth retroacts to the collective actions of the human beings? In, our, in other words, the Earth is reacting to human activities. And then we can see that in the climate crisis. And also characteristics of Lovelock's uh, Gaia, and, and the, the Latour thought that it is composed of agents that are neither deanimated, like uh, Galileo's billiard ball, or nor overanimated, like uh, Renaissance uh, naturalism. It is not a system, so not a mechanical system. It's rather an anti-system. There is no one thing that governs everything, okay? And not a living organism. A lot of people uh, got confused about that, you know, Gaia is an organism and that mythical figure. No, rather it's a super organism. It's a Latour's term, a collection of parts that fulfill a function. So it's not pre-planned. It's going and then reacting and collectively. So the climate is the historical result of reciprocal connections which interfere with one another. So uh, this picture of this is a, is a cover page of uh, the Nature in published in 2015, and in this really captures um, the the meaning of uh, the Anthropocene. And in, in the Anthropocene, there is no division between nature and culture humans and non-humans, etc. The social is never separate from the nature, natural. And then you can see that in human bodies, there were all sorts of uh, human activities, and also uh, the natural uh, phenomena as well. Bruno Latour, uh, this year in March, uh, sent a Twitter saying that, remember when it was hard to accept that non-humans, like my microbes, could be a full-fledged actors actants rather, able to build up associations in addition to those more classically social. Now it's a common sense. Here is the Chinese pollution, with or without virus. In other words, non-humans can change human behaviors and, and the nature. This is a perfect example that he uh, tries to show. So a lot of uh, people uh, working on the Anthropocene trying to find the evidence, and also the natural scientists are trying to find the evidence how human activities, like uh, destroying the habitats or climate change and so on, create the rise of a coronavirus or the called the zoonotic disease, the, the disease coming from animals. So uh, it's, it's a quite a recent um, the paper published in, in Nature, it's published in August, uh, it says that, um, and then this is a, uh, the interview with a, the scholar, the scientist who uh, made a comment on this paper. This research offers an important correction. The greatest genetic threats, like a coronavirus, arise where, where natural areas have been converted to croplands, pastures, 
and urban areas. The patterns the researchers detected were striking. And then the, the, the researchers examined the 600 plus uh, places to, to show how uh, the, the habitat, habitat destructions caused the rise of bats and the rats and other, other animals. So coronavirus affected human activities. We all know that. But in fact, it is human activities that caused the, the virus of out, outbreak. We are getting what we created. So coming back to the first slide that I showed. And uh, now it's quite clear there is a high connectivity between the two sets of uh, ideas. Humans, non-human, living, non-living, mind, body, subjectivity, objectivity, culture, nature, politics and science. It's all connected. All it's called effect. And so, so nature, culture in today's garden is a symbol of connectivity. So I think it is fair to say that we are living in the world with a high connectivity. This is a very important epistemological uh, stance. We cannot separate between the two and rather with a combined perception, then we will be able to handle a number of important and threatening phenomena like a pandemic. And this, I think, is related to one of the main themes of the conference, which is thought life. Thought life means nature, culture, not separate as a one entity. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm Heon Jeon. I train in contemporary and technology art. And most recently, I have focused my attention on the study of bioart, which directly deals with nature and life as art objects. Considering that bioart mainly utilizes converging technologies to deal with the properties of living life, there are complex interests in various fields of science and technology. Therefore, the issue of what, how, and why on convergence is inevitably important. And in the sense, through bioart, we have a view of the current world trends and the backsides of society, the so-called era of the fourth industrial revolution or Hama 100. The more I dive into bioart, the more questions I continue to contemplate. What is life really? What is nature? What is it to be human? These questions are becoming more pressed with the recent COVID-19 pandemic. Similar to people all around the world, Korean citizens wear masks to defend against COVID-19, refraining from contact with others as much as possible in accordance with social distancing and other quarantine guidelines. In these circumstances, People take refuge in the natural environment, which provides relief and comfort, while at the same time, protection against the risk of infection. In nature, one can feel a sense of free life with the whole body and become aware of one's identity as a human. To illustrate, according to Google's COVID-19 community mobility reports, which currently tracks location data of Android mobile device users around the world. People visit parks more often than other spaces if the spread of COVID-19 is perceived to be low and under control. For example, visit parks by Koreans on August 11th and August 14th, 2020 was about 25% and 42% higher compared to the average visits from January 3rd to February 6th, 2020, 
as a reference value when the spread of COVID-19 was in its very early stages. This increase is highly significant considering that the fluctuations in visit rates of other species for the same periods were not as significant. With Korea's high population density, mainly in large cities, being a factor, the results of Google's report have far implications. It is evident that with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, society has become keenly aware of nature and life itself. Virtual and augmented reality technologies can reproduce nature with vivid colors. But this is not real, natural nature. People recognize the need to connect to nature, which is why they may seek to live near parks that are within walking distance rather than, say, a 10-minute car ride. And in the same light, the quantitative and qualitative gaps for access to nature has emerged to become similar to the gaps between the rich and the poor. COVID-19 has certainly highlighted the issues of social, economic, and political inequality, and that access to nature has emerged as a requisite for a higher quality of life. Just as the scarcity in works of art leads to higher monetary values, access to nature becomes increasingly coveted, and to have the right to possess real nature is in itself the right to exercise power. It is a paradox of the developed civilization and that there is a dilemma between developing nature and life in order to obtain nature and life. To this, we must ask the question, on what basis can humans exercise these rights? Bioart, deal with, which deals with life by way of converging technologies, cannot elude the same question. Technology is oriented towards a specific goal, which shows that its technology is not very really neutral. And bioart, where science, art, and life converge, there may be a conflict of values pursued by its domain. Conflicts of values can lead to ethical problems. While ethics is a principle of rational judgment for moral dilemmas, helping to ponder, choose, and justify right and wrong. In this present age, when the boundaries between right and wrong are intricately entangled, it's not easy for ethics to function as a clear judgment principle. For example, many bioart projects are conducted in scientific laboratories rather than in art studios. Therefore, various inputs such as experimental equipment, materials, and finances depend on institutional arrangements, policies, and economic support of the science industry. And in some cases, the scientific and ethical validity of the project is deliberated by the ethics committee. In evaluating ethics, purpose and method must be considered but it's not easy to discern whether a proper method is ethical in other contexts, in terms of art, science, and life. Also, because of interest in various fields conflict, it's difficult to judge ethics simply by separating its aspects. In general, bioart is subject to conflict, especially in the understanding of bioethics among other ethical aspects. This is because the standards and existing ideas that define life may differ slightly in each field. Even within science, there are differences in the concept and category of life for each field, so it's not simple to distinguish the boundary between life and non-life and to define it universally. In such a situation, as it relates to bioart projects, that are collaborations between fine artists and engineers, the bioethical perspective among team members may be more different. Moreover, not all artists have the same sense of ethical responsibility, 
and that some may criticize the deliberation of the Ethics Committee for the project as inappropriate, while others agree with the committee's deliberation for raising awareness about the risks that the project may pose. And in the process of ethical conflict, the artistic and aesthetic intentions and plans of the project are sometimes modified or changed by teams that may consist entirely of engineers and only one or few artists. Even if bioart takes a critical position and raises objections to the contradictions and problems of existing ethical standards or concepts. One thing is clear here, and that such attempts are already implemented within the system of science. A bioart project is not free from the frame of scientific research method, since proceeds according to laboratory guidelines and requires deliberation by the ethics committee within the guidelines of bioethics consist with biotechnology. Therefore, we may face issues such as whether it is appropriate for an art project to depend on biotechnology to criticize the bioethical contradiction of the biotechnology, and whether the method of criticism is ultimately in line with the purpose and value of science and technology. Bioart dealing with life is bound to conflict between the right to create art and its ethical obligations. Does bioart have the right to process life? If only the ethics of the laboratory is followed, is the indulgence of ethics followed? Isn't this immoral? So, should bioart be moral? If art must be moral, how is art's creativity and autonomy guaranteed? Is art autonomy essential? What should art endure for its autonomy? Bioart is definitely scientific, but bioart is not science. Therefore, it is somewhat contradictory to evaluate and judge whether an art project is appropriate according to the principles and norms of science. Because of this, a specific understanding and judgment on the ethical legitimacy of bioart is also necessary. Since the 20th century, Everything that exists in the world has been used as an art object, but life cannot be treated so carelessly. To get the rights to it, we need justification for the legitimacy of the process beyond purpose and outcome. Sometimes advanced engineering introduced in bioart is highlighted. So, even though the work was carried out to criticize the power of science and technology that exerts on life, the outstanding technology attracts attention regardless of intention. It's like the tail wagging the dog. In this situation, knowledge and understanding of technology with the optimistic or blind curiosity must precede art thereby unintentionally leading to scientific elitism in art. This is one of the trends that appear in current technology arts, including bioart. Ironically, as new creations are carried out with cutting-edge technology, thoughts and concerns about art and discussions or understanding of art become increasingly rare. Shouldn't there be a basis and meaning for how this creation is art? For this, it's necessary to reflect on art, a fundamental reflection on whether art can manipulate life artificially and on what grounds art can deal with life is necessary. It is not a biotech reflection on bioethics, but a reflection of bioart on it. 
this contemplation of art will eventually lead to reflection on the essence of art. Where should art now go? What is the essence of art? It is a task for technology arts as well as bio art in the era of the new normal. It's time to rethink art again. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Soyo Lee. I'm a visual artist living and working in Seoul and also a lecturer at the Korea National University of Arts. For the past couple of years, I've been paying attention to several local plants for their ethnobotanical significance. Among them, I will focus on my encounter with Paulonia tomentosa for this talk. P. tomentosa is a common native plant species found throughout our city. Later in this talk, I'd like to take my observation into the context of third nature as described by anthropologist Anna Tsing. I'm sure all of you would be able to find comparable examples in your neighborhood around the world. First, I will show you some taxonomic as well as cultural features of P. tomentosa. Then I will show diverse fragments of its life as an agent of today's urban environment in Seoul. Temporarily, there is an empty lot adjacent to the Korea National University of Arts campus. It is about 115 square meters and it used to look somewhat like this before it was cleared out for urban renewal last year. The area was mostly packed with houses built in the 1980s as private housing for the employees at the Agency for the National Security Planning, or ANSP. In fact, a part of the Korea National University of Arts campus is currently using the former ANSP buildings uh, after it relocated to a different part of Seoul in 1995. Before a luxurious townhouse complex comes in in the next year or so, uh, the lot would be free of everyday human activities. This is a news clip from June 2020 showing the Reconstruction, Reconstruction Association meeting which took place at this site. Map of the lot and the townhouse floor plans. I sneaked into this lot a few weeks ago to take a peek at a P. tomentosa specimen uh, I had been watching from the other side of the brick wall. As you can see, this individual has a main trunk which seems about 20 years old with uh, newer coppice shoots. I will get back to this tree in a little bit. Polonia tomentosa is a deciduous tree in the genus Polonia first identified in 1841 by German botanist E.G. von Streude. It is native to parts of China as well as the entire Korean peninsula. During the Japanese occupation in 1925, Ueki Homiki, professor at the Agricultural and Forestry College Suwon, identified Paulonia coreana based on the dotted patterns in the petal. However, this nomenclature remains unresolved as of now. As the physical habitat as well as social-cultural relations of human and non-human organisms do not always coincide with national boundaries, there is still much to be researched about the phylogenetic and ethnographic aspects of this plant. Here you see mature trees in bloom in May 2020, um, some anatomical features and different types of leaves. This large one is an example of young leaf from a coppice stem. Coppice stems produce such larger leaves to maximize photosynthesis and growth. These are some more details showing flower buds, seeds, and seed pods. And finally, a colored scanning electron microscope image of a single P. tomentosa seed. Each seed is about three millimeters in diameter, but have wing-like structures to be carried to remote uh, locations by wind. From the 19th to early 20th century, you can find evidence from Feng Shui and folklore that P. tomentosa were intentionally planted in the yard. As seen in these folk paintings, the plant was valued as the only tree on which the phoenix would uh, rest on when a good ruler was in power. In olden days, aristocratic and elite families would plant P. tomentosa at the birth of a girl 
This fast growing tree matures within 10 to 15 years, so it can be cut down and carved into wooden furniture as your diary. The wood was also excellent for making musical instruments. However, P. tomentosa eventually became inadequate for urban households after the 1970s. Most people no longer harvested wood to make their own furniture. And this fast growing tree, as well as fast spreading plant, uh, requires more pruning and maintenance than most landscaping trees. Coming back to the tree in the empty lot, Judging from the way in which the main trunk has squeezed through the brick wall, it was probably not planted as part of someone's garden. Seen from the other side of the wall, the main trunk has been uh, pruned several times before the tree was left to mature into shape. I was able to assume that this individual have been flown into the spot as a seed and then has started off as a weed rather than a garden plant who eventually found a place in this neighborhood after one or two decades of tug of war with human residents. It was probably difficult to decide whether to take down the tree at the time of demolition because the root would have stretched uh, out through and under the brick wall independent of administrative districts set by humans. I'm looking forward to seeing how this tree is dealt with uh, as the construction progresses at this fall. Although this lot looks empty from afar, it contained a variety of plant specimens, and interestingly, many of them were reflecting traces of vegetable and flower gardens that no longer exist. Most of these herbaceous plants will be uprooted or covered once the construction begins, but I look forward to seeing any that might spread and revive in the neighborhood. Before leaving the slot, I gathered a whole lot of berries from black nightshades and cherry tomatoes um, that are own, not owned by anyone at this time. This experience reminded me of the book The Mushroom at the End of the World by anthropologist Anna Tsing, which came out in 2018. Since its publication, the book has been actively referenced in the humanities and arts communities in Korea as well. In this book, the author carefully maps out the complexity of fragmented relationships among the human gatherers and consumers of Matsutake mushrooms, the fungi, and the former industrial pine forests of North America. These forests, as described by Singh, are disturbed nature and natural habitat for Matsutake at the same time. Matsutake cannot be cultured by humans, but flourishes in forests that have been heavily disturbed by humans. After the decline of industrial forestry in North America, the forest workers have transformed to mushroom gatherers, finding new ecology and economy outside of global capitalism. Singh defined first nature as ecological relationships, second nature as capitalist transformations to these relationships, and finally third nature as what manages to live on despite capitalism. Her idea of third nature allows us to appreciate and pay attention to the autonomy of all agents in a given ecological relationship and to be careful not to overestimate the human effects in this biosphere across deep time. Paulonia tomentosa in Seoul is an offspring of traditional home gardens. However, the species has lost commercial value and practical use and is no longer compatible with contemporary urban architecture. People have mixed feelings about the plant. It still lives in our memories, folklores, myths, and cultural traditions of the bygone times. It also pleases our eyes with lush flowers for a couple of months in the spring. However, from June to October, people struggle to protect various architectural structures from its fast-growing branches and roots, large leaves, and the abundance of seeds and seedlings uncontrollably spreading um, everywhere by wind. I must also point out, uh, most people living in Seoul are probably oblivious to the existence of this organism. P. tomentosa in Seoul has a different biological life cycle and economical value than edible white mushrooms in Tsing's story. However, once I started noticing it, I could not stop. It seemed to pop up like mushrooms in the woods after the rain, providing clues as an instance of third nature in relation to developmentalism and urban renewal. Thank you for watching. 
and I will end this talk with selected image of Pete Tormentosa in my neighborhood in Seoul. Thank you.